So what I'd really like to focus on today, first of all, is recognizing that as clinicians and as you, as you think about treating patients that present to you after ACL surgery uh, or after ACL injury, one of the things that's most critical for us is recognizing that in order for us to be able to get them to that point of return to play, we have to be successful with respect to the ACL rehabilitation program. Um, and I wanna just give a little bit of history and background because that was my charge today, uh, looking at historically where we've been and where we are today, because certainly uh, those principles of ACL rehabilitation, uh, when we look back to where we were back in the 70s and the, and the 80s, um, we had such a high complication rate after ACL surgery that it was extremely challenging to get patients back after, uh, after those procedures. So I want to emphasize some of those points today that in order for us to be able to get patients back to return to play and get back to sport and to have the best chance of getting them back to sport, we have to ensure that the rehabilitation program that we're following um, is most appropriate and is going to give them the best success rate possible as far as getting back to, uh, getting back to sport. Um, I think it's also important to recognize that if you take some time to look at the literature and to go back in time and look at ACL rehabilitation protocols and, and some of the classic articles of ACL rehab, you recognize that there was not a lot of discussion with respect to return to play. Um, and that's obviously changed a great deal. And most of the evidence back, again, in that time frame of the 70s and 80s and even into the 90s, was, was more empirically based information as opposed to, to evidence based information. And then I'm going to just share with you um, a return to play program that we actually are just getting started within the clinics that I'm working in. I'm currently working with uh, a company based out of Chicago, Illinois. We have about 350 clinics throughout the Midwest, and we've just started and just implementing a return to play program, and I want to share with you some of the principles of that. So if we just take a few minutes and look historically about this whole idea of ACL rehabilitation, we recognize that during the 1970s, there was a fair amount of basic science information, basic science research being done, and, th th and that basic science research focused in two primary areas. It focused on looking at the vascularity of this ACL graft, and, and, and at this point, predominantly we we're talking about uh, autogenous patella tendon. Um, and in addition, some of the research was focused on the strength of that graft because the basic science literature and then extrapolating that basic science information to the clinical environment, uh, we thought that we had to be very cautious and careful with respect to the rehabilitation so that we're not straining that graft or causing that graft to fail. So there was a great deal of controversy within the literature and within clinical practice with respect to what is range of motion doing in terms of straining or stressing the graft and how is that going to influence their ACL rehabilitation program? What about quad strengthening? Um, and the debate was, does a full arc knee extension uh, strain the ACL to such an extent that it's going to cause that graft to fail? And what about weight bearing? Is weight bearing a, a, a critical consideration? So those factors are certainly things that that, that were a big part of this concept of rehabilitation after ACL surgery. Um, and, in, and a lot of the investigation really attempted to quantify some of those factors. Uh, how much graft is put on, or how much strain is put on the graft with different exercises and things that we're doing with patients every day in the clinic at that point. Um, in addition, also looking at the histology of that graft because so much of the work that was done in that time period looked at the animal model, looked at goats and primates and dogs, and, and, and we attempted to extrapolate that data but started to recognize that that information may in fact not be, be that relevant to the human model. So these basic science these basic science studies that were done at that time really led us to believe that ACL graft healing really is more of a long-term process. And in fact, there was a phase in that, 
that process after ACL surgery where the graft is extremely weak and therefore we had to be cautious with respect to how we were progressing the patient through their ACL rehabilitation program thinking that the graft was very weak and was very vulnerable and so therefore we weren't able to allow them what they needed to do at certain points in order to be able to get back to sport. So with the traditional ACL rehabilitation program of the 70s and 80s, the emphasis was just purely placed on protecting the graft. Um, and so therefore the principles of, of those rehabilitation programs at that time were strict immobilization, we were casting patients, uh, we limited their knee extension thinking that that was gonna put too much stress on the graft and cause the graft to fail. We limited their weight bearing and we delayed their return to sport. And how this relates to returning to sport was the fact that the complication rate of these patients um, at this time following these traditional rehabilitation programs uh, was such that the complication rate was in the 20, 30, 40 percent rate depending on, on who you read at that time. And the reason why we saw such a high complication rate was the fact that these patients had flexion contractures and they had extensor mechanism dysfunction and they had chronic weakness. And as each of you know, sitting here and treating patients after ACL surgery, we know in fact that that's a, a, that is gonna limit the patient's ability to be able to return to play. So most, again, of the ACL programs of, of, the, of the 80s that, that uh, was the beginning of many of our clinical practices were extrapolated from these basic science models and again centered on this whole premise that we needed to protect the ACL graft and the ACL programs of that time included immobilization, limited uh, knee range of motion, restricted weight bearing and a, and a very delayed return to sport. The classic article by Paulus and Noyes back in the 1980s had patients returning to sports somewhere around 18 months after ACL surgery. Um, and, and again, because of the fact that they were extrapolating a basic science model to get us to a point um, of uh, a clinical model. So despite the fact that those, these patients seemed to have good stability, the problem was that they had such a high complication rate that it was difficult for them to be able to return to play. And as we continue to investigate graft strength and graft healing and revascularization, um, we started to challenge some of that thinking and some of that thought process. Um, and in fact, is this something that we really need to follow with the human model based on, again, some of our clinical and empirically based information? So in fact, we thought that maybe, and we're looking at other aspects of musculoskeletal care, and in fact, starting weight bearing sooner with ankle fractures actually led to a greater healing rate. And so looking at that healing model, is it something that after ACL surgery, is it possible that we could start to stress the graft as opposed to protecting the graft and may allow these patients to begin to return a, a little bit more quickly? So one of the studies at our center by Root Graf and Shelbourne looked at in vivo um, assessment of that graft, uh, both in terms of looking at the graft arthroscopically and doing a histological analysis of the graft. And that in fact suggested that some of the early stresses that we were doing at that time, which was allowing patients to get extension early and started progressive weight bearing early on, may in fact be beneficial to graft healing. Um, and that, I think, really started some of the trends of really moving away from a lot of those restrictions in terms of range of motion and what kind of strengthening we were doing on weight-bearing aspects. And then the Shelbourne and Nitz article out of our center came uh, back in 1990 where we started emphasizing this whole idea of accelerated ACL rehabilitation. Um, and and as, as, as I'm sure some of you know, maybe most of you know, the whole basis um, in some respects of ACL rehabilitation moving to being accelerated was the fact that we were seeing in a certain aspect of the patients at our clinic that were actually able to return to play much sooner was because of their non-compliance. Those patients that were doing things much quicker than we ad advised them to based on the basic science model protocol, if you will. So we started emphasizing the fact that we needed to delay the surgery to allow the patient to rehab preoperatively. We needed to allow the patient to get that, that symmetry model, getting them back to 
whatever amount of knee extension they possessed on the contralateral limb. Starting weight bearing earlier, and then this whole aspect of functional strengthening. And some of the retrospective data from this particular paper revealed the fact that those patients who did those things, not only was their complication rate less, but their isokinetic scores were higher, their stability scores remained the same or better than those of the group that, that followed the traditional program. Um, and we saw a dramatic decrease in manipulations and scar resections and some of those additional operative procedures, again, all of which allowed those patients to return to sport much more quickly, okay, um, because of the fact that their complication rate was, was much less. So when we think back, and again, historically looking back at this whole idea of return to play back in the 90s, um, as far as shifting ACL rehabilitation to a more accelerated approach, we don't use that term anymore. But we emphasize, again, a clinical model of ACL rehab that, again, emphasizes symmetry, that emphasizes symmetrical knee extension and flexion, um, that emphasizes um, appropriate functional strengthening and setting parameters to allow these athletes to return to play. But as we look back, what we were looking at at that time with respect to return to play included, uh, again, that symmetry of, 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 of range of motion about the knee, we used isokinetic scores at that time. We're not doing isokinetic testing any longer. Some may still be, and that's, that's great. Um, but we used 70% at that time as, as a model of allowing patients to start, start to do some, some running and some sport-specific drills. We were doing leg press testing at that time, looking at uh, how much strength patients were generating, and we had an apparatus set up to look at, at uh, isometric strength and, and comparing uh, uh, the, to the contralateral limb. KT1000 scores looking at the spillity of their knee as well as single leg hop testing. And that was generally the criteria that we were following. In my work with Dr. Shelbourne over about a 20 year time period, his focus and therefore our focus at that time was centered on the, the key thing of return to play is if you have a basketball player that wants to get back to playing basketball, let's get their knee to a point where they have adequate range of motion, we assess their strength as I alluded to, and let's get them back on the court and start doing that sports specific activity. Um, and we were criticized significantly because of that model, but that was the model that we followed and was were successful at that time period during the 90s and into the 2000s in terms of getting these patients back to, uh, back to sport. Um, and I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit more about um, how that's changed over the last decade or so. So I think that, again, if the whole concept of what we're talking about today is return to play, um, and my clinical practice today is uh, about 99% of the patients I see are patients with knee pathology, um, I think there are still um, these critical success factors. Um, and I continue to see today patients that struggle, um, struggle after ACL surgery or struggle with whatever knee problem that, that I'm seeing them for. Um, but I think these critical success factors not only uh, are, are important with respect to, to ACL patients, but certainly with, with other patients with knee pathology as well. Um, and this whole idea of preoperative rehabilitation um, is the fact that, again, preparing this patient for um, this operation, both physically and allowing them time, as Claire alluded to a few minutes ago, the psychological aspect of what we do is critically important on a day-to-day -day basis, particularly with, uh, with our high-level athletes. So this idea of preoperative rehabilitation to get, again, that knee back to as normal as possible um, and addressing the psychological component is critically important. And this is something that I see every day. Um, uh, in terms of patients that struggle, whether that patient is, you know, a high school athlete trying to return to, to playing soccer, uh, whether it's a basketball player, whatever this athlete might be. Um, and in fact, I see this a lot with older adults as well, where based on their injury or operative procedure that they had done, they have not achieved symmetry. They don't have a symmetrical knee range of motion equal to the contralateral side. And therefore, I think that because of that lack of symmetry, they're not able to return to function. 
um, not able to gain the strength that they need, not able to gain the quickness and agility and, and the confidence in their knee because their knee feels different. If we have a tight, constrained knee because of a lack of range of motion, and that range of motion is not just osteokinematic range of motion, that's arthrokinematic range of motion. That's the ability for uh, our patients to achieve that normal anterior-posterior glide and internal and external tibial rotation and medial lateral glide. Um, that symmetry model applies to patients across the board and is something that's critically important, I think, to allow this patient to achieve symmetry, which will then allow them to gain the strength and function they need as part of a return to play model. I also think that this whole idea of, achieve, of attempting to achieve range of motion and attempting to achieve strength at the same time can be conflicting. And by that I mean that, and again, I see this rather routinely, and, uh, and I think Claire did a great job today of emphasizing the fact that, you know, we have patients at all, all aspects of the, of the, of the bell-shaped curve. Those patients that are successful with a, with a, uh, with a non-operative approach after ACL surgery, those patients to get back quickly after an ACL surgery. Um, and so when you, when you take and look at that model, most of our patients, 80% of them that fall within that middle of the bell-shaped curve, it's not a problem in terms of getting motion and progressing strength. Uh, but I think there are patients, and a high number of them, um, that they attempt to push strength and I think we're at fault at times where we're pushing strength too quickly when they don't have that symmetry restoration. They don't have that full range of motion back, that symmetrical knee extension and flexion, and that patellofemoral mobility, that tibiofemoral mobility, that arthrokinematic motion back. And therefore, when you try to push strength in those patients, when they don't have that motion back, they struggle. They're not able to get that strength because of the fact that their joint is still tight and still constrained. And I think, again, limits their ability to return to daily life and return to sport, which is our focus today. The, the, the next concept, again, is recognizing and, and being a, a clinician as long as I have, I've seen the, 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 uh, the pendulum shift a number of times from this whole concept of we want to look at isolated strengthening as the most critically important thing that we do, and then that's not good. You want to do functional strengthening. You want to put your foot on the ground, and you want to plant that foot and strengthen that way. And I think we've come to a balance, and that balance needs to include concern with respect to the stresses that are put on both the tibiofemoral joint and the patellofemoral joint as part of that strengthening. And you, as clinicians, recognizing in cooperation with your physician, what does that patellofemoral joint, that tibiofemoral joint, look like intraoperatively um, is another important factor so that you can adjust the rehabilitation based on what you know about the integrity of those joint surfaces. Uh, and then the, the final concept, which is really um, the fact, and again, the, the, the based on where we were with return to play back in the 90s when we were shifting to this idea of accelerated rehabilitation, uh, we saw a lot of patients that I think because of what we term uncontrolled joint forces, meaning that we're just not strong enough and therefore as these patients get back to running and jumping and those kind of activities, what you're seeing is the knee joint gets sore, it gets swollen, get, it gets stiff, limiting again their progression in terms of return to play. So we have to have an appreciation, and I think we do this much better today than we did in the past as far as what are the strength parameters that we need to look at in order to allow them to return to play. So, uh, and that's, uh, I think, a, an important factor. So this has been mentioned briefly already, but, uh, but at our center, again, as we've developed this return to play progression, um, a couple factors that all of us want to keep in mind, uh, we recognize, and, and we've known this for decades, that patients after ACL surgery have a greater risk of tearing their contralateral ACL than they do of tearing their ipsilateral ACL. Um, and that's been documented quite a bit. We know there's a high injury rate, uh, re-injury rate. Um, and we also know that, again, this whole concept of symmetry, um, that those athletes are able to attain symmetry. Um, and that, again, isn't just motion, but is strength and functional strength, and, um, is a, are able to reduce their potential for future failure. Um, and uh, with the data that Claire presented a little while ago, we recognize that 
some of these patients are able to return within a year, and I like the rule of thirds. Um, but there certainly are patients that don't get back for numerous reasons, and, and I think the psychological aspect is something that's important. So as far as the return to play again, we have to be uh, very specific as far as the, um, the, the, the factors of the ACL protocol um, and the first phase, and again, we all have differences as far as how we address patients postoperatively, but again, I think that regardless of your graft source, regardless of, of whatever uh, additional surgical procedure that you may have, they may have had done at the time of surgery. Again, we're looking for symmetry, um, and that's full extension and normal gait are the general clinical parameters. Um, second phase at two to six week time frame, we begin early strengthening then. Again, remembering what I talked about in terms of conflicting goals of motion and strength, uh, we're not doing a lot of strengthening within that really first six week time period other than adequate strength to allow good leg control that allows them to restore gait. And then it's at that around that six week time frame that we're starting to progress strengthening. And that's where we start to integrate some strengthening, endurance training, and certainly some low demand kind of running drills. Then the fourth phase is where we enter this return to play progression as far as, again, what we've, the parameters that we've started to set out. And the criteria to enter that phase, that initial return to, to play phase, um, is again, full motion. We're looking at single leg hop and have just started to try to establish what are the adequate parameters of a single leg hop to start this return to play. Um, and then doing a single leg leg press, one repetition max, again, as, as, as uh, a, a beginning basis. Uh, and again, our goals here, again, are working towards normalization of lower extremity strength, emphasizing neuromuscular power, endurance, neuromuscular control, and again, starting again very slow, um, but appropriate sport-specific drills at that point. Um, and then phase five of our progression, um, again, entering um, this particular aspect of our return to play program. Again, we're looking for progress. Uh, and again, looking at single leg hop, one repetition max leg press. Um, and the, again, the goals here are um, this gradual return to uh, unrestricted sport, of course, is the main goal for all of us. Maximizing strength, endurance, and neuromuscular control, and again, this whole concept of, of um, sport-specific skill training. So in this particular phase, we're well, some of the objective criteria that we're starting to use as far as return to play are patients completing their IKDC, and we're looking for a score of, uh, of at least 70. Um, to allow them to progress. We're doing uh, functional movement screen testing and looking for a score of at least 15. We're doing the Y balance test as a parameter uh, of assessing patients um, in this particular phase as well. So once patients have met the criteria that we started to establish, then our goal then is to move toward video analysis of these patients. And we've just set up a number of different parameters, but certainly are things that, uh, and, and that can be individualized. But what we're looking for here by, uh, as, as you well know, looking at patients with your eye versus uh, having a video uh, analysis ability certainly gives us a little bit better appreciation of how patients are performing. Uh, so looking at their single leg hop, um, doing the hop testing sequence, box jumping, tuck jumps, double leg squatting, single leg squatting. You know, again, we have established a number of parameters that we want to videotape. And actually, this has gone pretty quickly in the clinic because patients are starting to do some of these uh, uh, functional things early on that allows them to progress into this. Uh, and again, we're looking at posture and position and landing position and so on as part of that video analysis. So once we're satisfied with all that, that video aspect of things, then what we're looking at is fatigue. So we want to start looking at um, once our patients start to fatigue, as is, as we know, a normal part of that return to sport, then we want to see how well are they performing. So this is one paper in the literature, and there are others looking at a fast fatigue protocol. Um, and then again, assessing and doing some additional video analysis after they've done that fast fatigue protocol, how effectively are they, are they continuing to perform? Um, and then, again, uh, very sport-specific agility training as part of that return to play part three.
Um, and then finally, once we're satisfied with all of that, you're doing a practice walkthrough, um, working through full speed, uh, uh, non-contact and non-contact drills, and then certainly using all those parameters with the patient, assessing how, how well they're feeling um, as uh, the physician and ourselves making that decision in terms of return to play. So I think that it's, it's important in terms of when we look at patients after ACL surgery or after an ACL injury um, that it's our responsibility um, as sports physical therapists, we play a major role in um, looking at and making sure that the patients are successful with respect to every phase of that ACL rehabilitation program. And again, probably 80% of our patients do extremely well. Um, but again, we have to be uh, cognizant of those patients that um, have clinical problems, whether the, those patients that the joint is a bit tight, a bit constrained, they're not progressing in terms of their leg control and their gait and their strength isn't improving. And, and I think much of that, again, relates to this whole idea of ensuring that we have, that have symmetry, full range of motion. Um, and then, uh, and again, this whole arthro-osteokinematic uh, concern, I think, is real, and I see it every day, and it's something that I think uh, hopefully is an important take-home message for you. And then our progression in terms of strength, of course, as we all know, is what allows our patients to return to sport. Um, but I also think that um, it's important to not lose sight of, of your clinical reasoning skills. Uh, the fact that we have lots of evidence uh, there's much more evidence today than we've had at our disposal with respect to um, outcomes after ACL surgery and graph models and fixation and all those kind of things that are debated at every meeting. Um, but I think the most important thing for us, because we, of, of all the people in the healthcare model that treat these athletes, we spend the most time with them um, and don't discount the importance of your clinical reasoning in managing these patients after ACL surgery. Thank you very much.